Wow. <laughs> I run a charity and have many speaking opportunities. I actually suffer from stage fright, but I am passionate about our cause. And I especially love speaking with children. When I look at the children, I see world changes. I get so excited because our children can make a difference right where they are, and they have the potential to transform our world. This is not something that I just read about or believe in. I've witnessed this with my own eyes thousands of times all over the world with my own children, as well as with thousands of students that I've been privileged to work with. Although children are capable of making the most amazing impact, I see three worrying trends that limit their potential. Firstly, many children do not see or care about the needs of the world. Even though we live in a world that is more connected than ever before, a lot of young people remain disconnected with society. This disconnection goes hand in hand with an alarming decline in empathy. Researchers in the University of Michigan reported in 2010 that college students now are 40% less empathetic than those from 30 years ago. Secondly, even when children are motivated to help, their creative ideas are often not supported. When we question the validity or the feasibility of their ideas, it discourages them. When we ask them to focus on academics or activities that we think are important for them to survive in a competitive world, we diminish their freedom to daydream and come up with innovative solutions. Thirdly, as a society, we often underestimate small actions and small people. We dismiss small actions because they don't look significant enough to have any impact and are therefore unworthy of our time. We see ourselves, the adults, as providers and our children, our dependents. When we cannot see how capable our children already are today, they also cannot see it. And if our children cannot see it, they cannot do it we can become so focused on what our children will achieve or become tomorrow that we forget that they already are someone today. It's been said that giving should not be an activity, but a lifestyle. I would say that giving is core to who we are and fundamental to our happiness and well-being. Did you know that the word generous comes from the root word genre, noble birth, from the stem genus, genesis, describing our very origin? You and I were born to live generously, and that is why giving is so good for us. Countless studies have shown that when we help or donate, our bodies release chemicals that make us high, legally. <laughs> People who help live longer and are healthier. They report lower stress, better friendships, stronger sense of purpose, belonging and gratitude, higher levels of happiness and life satisfaction. I'm out of fingers. <laughs> when we make life better for others, life is also better for ourselves. Our children can make a difference and reap the benefits of giving today. To do that, they need empathy, creativity, and small actions, be it big or small. A Harvard study may give us insight as to why we are seeing this decline in empathy. Of the 10,000 students surveyed, 80% ranked achievement or happiness as their priority while only 20% ranked caring as their priority. Now, what's even more interesting is that this same picture is seen in the students' perception of their parents' priority. In fact, students are three times as likely to report that their parents would be prouder of them if they'd gotten good grades than be caring members of class or school. These statistics give pause for thought. 
while we adults may think or say that caring for others and doing good is important, they're not always translated into action. Our children learn by imitation and immersion. If doing good is low on the priority list of adults and by extension of children, we lose our birthright to give and we suffer as a society. So how can we switch on empathy? I am a doctor. My husband and I founded New Sight, an eye charity that treats and prevents blindness. In 2012, we left our jobs, uprooted our lives from the UK, and together with our three young children, moved our home to the rural Republic of Congo to pioneer an eye surgical center. So I thought I knew about caring and giving, but it took an incident in the same year in the Congo jungle for me to understand what is needed to activate empathy. My husband was hurrying to the eye center one day when he saw a stranger pushing his wife in a wheelbarrow. He stopped, turned around, and helped them move and push, even though they were going in opposite direction. We found out that Ellen was blind, we operated on her, her sight recovered, and her life was transformed. But I myself also saw something that changed my own life. You see, I realized that if it had been me who met them instead of my husband that day, I would never have stopped. And Ellen would most likely have remained blind forever. While I believed that I was a caring person, I was simply too busy looking down at my devices, my to-do list, my stuff. We have one shot in life, and we have a choice to live it looking down or looking up. If we don't look up, we will not see. If we do not see, our hearts will not be moved. And if our hearts are not moved, we all need to care. But if we don't care, we will miss the essence of humanity. We will miss all the natural benefits of giving. And far too many in this world will continue to suffer. We cannot let our children miss what life was meant to be. We want them to show up to life. We need them to show up to life. And showing up starts with looking up. We must help our children to look up and see. Let's read them news articles and biographies of inspirational people who give. Let's take them to concerts and events that support meaningful courses. Let's ask them, what good deed did you get to do today? Because you see, it's not that we have to do good, but that we get to do it. And as our children look up, see, and feel, their minds will naturally start to wonder what they can do. In 1968, NASA asked two doctors to develop a test to test measure the innovative potential of their scientists. As a result, the duo developed a creativity test that proved highly effective. They went on to administer this test to 1,600 five-year-olds. What they found was astonishing. At age five, 98% were geniuses on the creativity scale. At age 10, same tests on the same children had dropped to 30%. At age 15, 12%. As for us adults, I'm sorry, 2%. This decline in creativity scale from a 98% to 2%, it is complex. But our role as parents is to do what we can to maintain our children's creativity for as much as possible, for as long as possible. Last month, a bunch of nine-year-old girls said to me that they miss daydreaming because they have too many tests, too much homework, too many competitions, activities. One of them went on to say to me that adults are always telling her why something is not going to work. This greatly sobered me, as I recall the many times when my own children would come up with an idea, ask me if I could do it, and I'd say, oh, that's great, but, you know, I think it's a bit more complicated than that, or it's not that easy, or I'm not sure if we have enough time. 
time. Sometimes I have neither the time or energy to handle my children's endless questions or seemingly crazy ideas. I mean, sometimes just trying to figure out what they're trying to say with their ideas can hurt my brain. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. My youngest child once said to me, "Mummy, I know that just now you said that that was a great idea, but I know that you weren't really listening." When you talk to people, you should give them your face. <laughs> Mummy, give me your face. For a task-oriented and impatient person like me, when I see my children daydreaming or doing things that don't look very productive or purposeful, I get uneasy because I worry that they'll waste their time. So I tell them, "Go study and practice your piano." But if we don't let our children daydream, if we don't let their minds wander, if we're too quick to say no, we are at risk of being the very ones killing the creativity of our own children, and we cannot afford to. The 2.3 billion children worldwide are a massive untapped resource. To come up with creative solutions against the most pressing problems of our world, most actions start small. When small people take small actions, we pat them on the heads and we say, "Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's sweet." We underestimate their power. We misjudge the size of the impact they're about to make. All over the world and throughout history. Small people have taken small actions that created massive impact. Alex Scott sold lemonades at the age of four, founded Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, which to date has raised 150 million U.S. dollars, funding 800 cancer research projects. Boyan Slat, a teenager, designed the world's first ocean plastic clear-up system. Is on track to halving the plastic there by 2025. Talia Lehman, when she was 10, asked her friends to trick or treat for cash instead of candies, which started a movement that raised 10 million U.S. dollars. And Talia then went on to mobilize 12 million children from 20 countries for other causes. And who can forget the bravery of Malala? And who can forget the universal impact of Anne Frank's diary? Imagine if all the children just took a step as these children did. When our daughter was six years old, she came home one day and excitedly announced, "I'm going to be rich. I've lost my two front teeth, and my friends promised me that the tooth fairy would come." And she was not disappointed to find two British pounds by her pillow in exchange for her two front teeth the next morning. She used the money to buy ingredients to bake a dozen cupcakes. With the money raised, she used them to make Christmas cards. And little by little, she raised enough money to pay for the cataract operation for one blind man, who today can see. What our little girl had was small, even laughable, but with just a little creativity. And by taking small actions, she transformed the life of one man and his entire family instantly, completely, forever. And her impact did not stop there. Her story grew into our project Two Front Teeth, that has since. Inspired many other children to create and embark on their own original fundraising projects to help hundreds more patients. We've had children growing plants. We've had children learning apps to make comics to sell, hosting concerts, printing calendars. We've even had children charging entry fees to their own bedrooms. For lion dance performances under the duvet, complete with lighting effects. <laughs> T 
time after time, children after children amaze me with what they can do with their creativity to help. It's been said that children are the leaders of tomorrow. But our children can already use what is already in their hands to make a difference today. My heart is so heavy for the needs of the world. Please join me in supporting the potential of our children to transform our world. Let's activate empathy. Let's be the very change that we want to see in our own children. If we will look up, there are opportunities to help them see everywhere. And when they see, they will care. And when they care, they will create. No messing with our little Einsteins. Let's slow down and cultivate their creativity and enjoy their funny, entertaining, crazy questions. Let our children dream of the world that they want to create and let them dream of how they can be the ones to create it. And as our geniuses come up with these innovative solutions, let's encourage them to take action. Let's not buy into the lie that it has to be big or difficult. Just do what is possible today. Giving is contagious. If our children will look up and see and feel and think and take a step, more and more children will do the same. Giving will grow exponentially and return to be the norm as it was always meant to be. And that is how our children will transform our world. Thank you. Thank you.